All right. So we begin again officially with Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. And uh, William Saf here, thank you very much for that chronology of your life experiences and your relationship to education, and which is the main focus of today's uh, seminar or webinar, if you if you will. Um, so we're going to hear now from our brother Kamal and uh, just hear what some of his background is. And he's He's got his hands in, in a lot of different endeavors. And uh, in the short amount of time that I've been made aware of you, Kamal, I've been very, very impressed. And not only with your skill set, your organizational abilities, but I'm actually more impressed with your personality. The fact that you're a young brother, uh, very well-intentioned and extremely helpful. You've been more helpful to me than you actually know. So I thank you for keeping this, as we would say, this connectivity as a key word for us, I believe, going forward, uh, this uh, connectivity. And uh, then we'll get to today's uh, lesson, if you will, that I had prepared for your wife. Okay. Okay. Um, thank you for the opportunity. It's a privilege and an honor. Alhamdulillah. William, thank you for uh, your uh, background. Um, I want to begin with that. I asked you what it is that you experienced in um, your past that had to do with corruption and leadership, and you expounded on selfishness. Um, I think, um, without having to revisit that, that Aishora, as Dr. Omar emphasizes, is absolutely essential. Okay, a group of leaders that are established, that have been there and have done that, have seen the pitfalls, have experienced um, the double-edged swords, that have experienced failure and success and most importantly what it seems like to me is you're just up there i mean you you mentioned you're 70 you're about to be 75 or you are 75 and you're you're hitting the, you're still hitting the back um that is that's fruitful uh and and um it, i'm very thankful to see that it's it's uh, rare but i'm very thankful to see that so what I do uh, currently is exactly that. I have established my own shore uh, in terms of business. Uh, you mentioned that I'm a you know business oriented. Uh, I I think without a group of people who've been there who've done that, you can't achieve anything, um, especially if you don't have experience. I don't. I don't have experience in education, but I've tasted the corruption. I've tasted the bitterness. I've tasted the suffering. In fact, I have suffered from a lack of proper education, a lack of a rational implementation, a lack of moral logic. Um, you know, I, I could say that being pulled out of the third grade uh, right into an Islamic school was a interesting shift. I went from a public school that was organized class to class, et cetera, et cetera, right into an unorganized Islamic school, for which I am very thankful for, hmm. despite the fact that I may seem the antithesis of traditional uh, Muslim, um, the traditional Islam, um, with everything that we're learning uh, in light of the um, corruption that we've, we've dealt with in Islam. So I've tasted that organizational shift personally. Um, so there was disruptions in my child development, my educational development, my own personal development from that age. Um, it, it was chaos and there was no curriculum. So what I did was I played all day. So I had that, I can, I can, I'm thankful for that, that I was creative. I was playful during those years, but I also missed out on grammar, on language arts, mm. on mathematics. Um, so I missed out on that and decided that personally, I made the decision, I wanna leave. Uh, so a couple of years later, I went back to public school to finish uh, middle school. So in the eighth grade, and then from there all the way to college. Um, I hated school. I was conditioned. You just, you just got to the point where everything was boring. If I sat down and paid attention, I'd get a minimum of a B. If I did homework and I actually wrote down notes, I would surpass. Got to the point where why is this so easy? You know, why? You know, I started asking myself questions and whatnot and got lost into, um, in, into my own nefs you name it, you know, just things that uh, teenagers go through, um, just having fun, too much fun. So 
I got to the point where I'm experiencing way too much pleasure and not enough happiness. Mm. And I had a moment of awakening mm. at around <clears throat> a couple of years ago, not that far off, uh, 18, 19. I read a book, Rich Dad, Poor Dad. It was the first book I read, <laughs> the first book I read uh, two days in a row. So 300 pages. I read 150 in one sitting and 150 the next day. And, and then from there on, I had decided, okay, I need to pick up a grammar book. I need to learn this. I need to learn that. And at the time, I was introduced to Hamza Yusuf, his, um, his YouTube channel, his lectures, his podcasts. And I was listening and looking at everything. And I said, I don't know where to start. This is my own personal development. I don't know where to start. Um, I listened to him and he said, pick up a book called How to Read a Book by Dr. J. Adler. I, I picked that up. I read it. And my entire life had changed in that exact, for that very moment. I had just recognized and connected the dots in every single previous experience that I had. It was the first time where you go through a book and wow, I actually have to think, oh, what does the, what is the author saying? <clears throat> what does he mean? What, what, what is his definition of this word? And so by learning that and learning how to read a book and having a guide, I started to question everything I was taught. I had already known fitra, you know, fitra based. There's already a feeling, there's always immediate intuition that this is all BS. This everything I've done is just, just a joke. Um, and ever since then, I had a keen interest and I've been developing my own personal understanding of proper education. And since then, that's all I've wanted to do. I'm passionate about it. Um, I've applied everything I, I've learned from uh, my own uh, readings to my own life. And I want to apply that to my children and I want to apply that to everyone. Um, so I've had some plateaus. There is always a plateau that a person hits and I've hit them. And at the very end, there's a spike. <laughs> you know, you're just you're learning, but you're not learning and you're just what's going on and then boom. So um, in that, I've applied everything to myself. Um, and at the very moment, I have established my own shore of my own business, um, a group of leaders, guys have been there who've done that. And my wife and I, share that similar passion we have different backgrounds different experiences but we share conclusions that lead to uh, formulating and developing um, proper educational institutions a proper educational educational curriculum which brings us here with the netx foundation um, i want to just go back and circle on the selfishness i think um, developing the foundation to mitigate uh, corruption with leadership is important whether that be doing it uh, as a business corporation i understand what corporation means literally um, and the ed etymological relationship so uh, depending on how you build that foundation yeah. is going to either catapult or hinder uh, future growth so Yeah, I just I just want to mention that there are details, there are ways to get around that. There are uh, there's the law, there's the rule of law. Um, right. What's that? Like the maritime law. The maritime law, yeah. So I just you know th those things should be kept in mind, um, and and that's I hope that that touches on my background. Uh, yeah, I hope that's enough. Uh, if there's anything else, just shoot at me. Sometimes I just get lost and I digress. But here it's good. It's all good. Yeah, it is good. Yeah. Now we heard from your wife yesterday, but for benefit of people who who haven't seen that video yet, <laughs> I'll ask you to give me just maybe two or three minutes of your background. Um so born and bred in England, United Kingdom. I spent my elementary years youth in the state school and spent my um, high at what we consider high school from 11 to 16 in an Islamic school. Um, I was of a very, very conservative Islamic community. Um, part of the uniform was actually wearing the face veil. Um, I saw, I mean, I saw a lot of beauty 
you know when it came to like the personal development you know the the nasiha that we were taught there was a lot of beauty in the islamic school but it there was a lot of um i guess there was a sense of detachment the islam that they were presenting wasn't human mm. it didn't touch like the core and and so why so in my um high school years there's a lot of um a, a lot of young girls still suffering with se- like a series of different mental health conditions mm. i mean my sister who's a year older than me her last year of high school one of her best friends was trying to like uh, jump off the roof it, 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 it there was mm. a huge contrast with and i think be- it was because the islam that we grew up with didn't have the whole fitra the understanding and the the way it was presented the way we were reading the quran or the hadith was very literal and you know so and so when i left i spent my next two years in um in a state school what we considered um college or sixth form and and so that was a big contrast because i was like um a face veiled young teenager now um with oh my gosh there's boys in the class <laughs> mm. and so it was a uh, and i was studying psychology english literature and sociology i loved the subjects always very passionate about um, learning and you know discovering things what i realized was the half of the school year you're learning how to answer an, an exam question you're not you're not learning the subjects you're learning how to take an examination that's going to last two hours of the whole you know mm-hmm. learning um experience and so i came to a point where i was like i was just angry i was like why are we doing this i am angry this has to change and and so i decided i wasn't going to go to university to get a degree i don't like this i'm gonna um I'm going to find teachers. And, you know, so I found um, a herbal traditional medicine teacher and I found um, that that we have one on one sessions with more or less in a very small classroom. Away from the state education as a private (coughs) educational environment, and then I found and then I found another professor of psychology that I would visit like once a week and have like a a conversation with a relationship with with a teacher not you know and then I came across you know Dr Mm. Omar and then I have my husband he's my other teacher Uh, I sincerely mean it Uh, and then yeah so and I think that's what when I started doing that at the age of 19 that's when I feel like I really become became educated of develop my education and um yeah that's all i guess okay yeah that's wonderful yeah wonderful all right so i'm going to bring up the rear by just uh casually discussing some of the etymology of the words that we've been using and some of the words that are used in education to describe education that themselves have become corrupt one of the first uh, manifestations of corruption is corruption in the language. It's when language becomes corrupt. So keep that in mind. In fact, the word corruption itself tells you what corruption actually is. Core. It's, it's, it's a rupture mm. in the core. You see that? Yes. It's and and a rupture is an interruption. Mm. So that means that what was supposed to be traveling at a particular pace, particular speed, you know, going on that journey, if that becomes interrupted by bandits who want to steal what you have on your moving train, the person who is doing the interrupting is the person who's carrying the corruption. There's a there's a rupture in their core. There's something that has become inconsistent within them. 
And now whatever poisons are pouring out of their system because of that rupture in their core <laughs> is beginning to spread and affect other people. And unfortunately, in this day and time, that corruption is affecting our very children. And it's designed to affect our children for generations to come because the core is not right. Now, they've visited the idea of core education and all of that, you know, C-O-R-E education and all of that. But that stuff is just foolishness as far as I'm concerned. It, it doesn't address what you mentioned earlier as the real human, you know, the real human needs of the, of the child or of the teenager. So what Nunetics is designed to do is bring everything back to its core values. You know, uh, the uh, whole idea of having a core is related to the idea of having a heart in Spanish, corazón, right? Core, again, right? Because it's the same word, you know, heart and core etymologically and nunetically are the same word. C interchanges with H as a guttural. There's the R in core and there's the R in heart and the T in heart is a suffix. It's a feminizer, just like in Arabic, marbuta. it's a feminizer. So it's letting you know that the heart is feminine. See, this is the help that we can bring to English speaking, English reading students, that we don't have to stay strictly with the Arabic if that's not the thing. We can go right into the English language and pull as much, maybe more, out of the English language and how it was constructed as we do with the Arabia. That's the beauty of nunetics. It can handle both languages. It can handle the Hebrew language. It's just a sister language to Arabic. So if we're talking to a classroom full of Jews, which I've, I've spoken to synagogues of Jews, and they were absolutely amazed, enthralled, and wanting to hear more until their rabbi shut it down. <laughs> I think we finished for the day. <laughs> they said, wait a minute. <laughs> wait a minute. I'm gonna, I have another question for Mr. Bilal. <laughs> This old man came to me after I spoke at a synagogue, a very popular synagogue in New York. There were about 80, uh, more, more of them were older uh, Jewish participants. And I was speaking on some of these various subjects in terms of etymology. I asked them the question. I said, uh, how many of you um, are college graduates? And it had to be 95% of the hands went up. Mm. Yeah, right? I said, um, how many of you, or can any of you give me the true, meaning, the true meaning for the word human? And I just stepped back. Mm. None of them raised their hands. So you see, you see the problem? The problem is in the deficit that we have in understanding words and language. So they couldn't tell me what the word human meant. In its etymology, they can just give me their own idea about what a human. Oh, he's a nice guy. She's a kind lady. You know, that's different. They're nice and kind animals, like the one you have right there, back and forth across your lap, right? <laughs> <laughs> he's, I don't know, he, she, but that cat is kind. He, he didn't seem to be bothering anything, you know. <laughs> but, so that's not all human life is. It's not just about being kind. You know, we speak of human beings as humankind. So your kindness is just your foundation. See? Ah. <laughs> ah. G agrees. Yes, indeed. I'm telling you, Allah sends us signs. As soon as you mentioned, she came walking yep. again. <laughs> this is so beautiful when you understand it. Allah lets you know that He is with you. I'm telling you, all you have to do is pay attention to the fitra. And that cat is as fitra as we are. Mm. What's the cat's name? Lulu. Lulu. Say it again. Lulu. 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 Okay, like a book publisher. <laughs> All right. And you know, Lulu is related to Lail. Yeah. I don't know if you knew that, but Lail, as you know, is the darkness of night. And you have a dark, you have a dark furred cat there, don't you? Mm. Yeah. And, and see, I say these things to constantly reiterate that we're not, the, we think we're in charge of naming our children and naming them. We're not in charge of anything. Allah actually says in the Quran to Adam, he gave him the responsibility of naming things in creation, mm. okay? And he says he named all of them, all of the things. So that's not a physical person in history who did that. That's a that's a prototype in the psyche that does that. Oh. Allah conditioned the human psyche to automatically know what to name things. Mm. And 
we'll get into that at some other point, but that's a part of our educational thrust. That's why we under, can, under, wow. yeah. That's why we can relate to the name and look break it down. Not only that, that's that's the most important thing, but a secondary importance is that's how Satan is never able to escape Allah's plan. Because Satan has to operate through language. He whispers, right? He has to operate the words. Mm. And he thinks he's getting away because he put the word in cold language. But he doesn't understand that the brain has been created so that it can, it can, it has to respond to frequencies. The brain is nothing but frequencies, five basic frequencies, whatever they call it in science, you know, beta, alpha, gamma. Yeah, mm -hmm. these are frequencies. And you can't operate outside of that fitra. Mm. That's why Allah says, let there be no alterations in his fitra. Mm. And it also means that you can't go outside of his fitra, even though it looks like you are. But it's just a matter of time before Allah brings it full circle right back to his fitra, to his plan, his program, his sunnah is called in the Quran. And it says his sunnah never changes. So how the brain absorbs language is the same for every human being on planet Earth. Mm -hmm. How do we know? Because before you taught a baby any words, the baby came here with sounds. The first sound was a cry. No baby comes here laughing. Every baby comes here absolutely serious. If we can maintain that serious, seriousness up until the time they get into a classroom, we'll, we'll, we'll have geniuses. Because it's the, it's the parents and the grown-ups that make the child silly. The child does not want to be silly. The child wants to be scientific. The child starts looking at his hand like a scientist would do in a laboratory. What is this? Turning it around, touching stuff, touching mommy's face. Mm -hmm. So the child is, is serious. It's it's us that go, goo, goo, ga, ga, you know, and then make the child chuckle. Oh, this is silly. Who is this silly person? In front? Then after a while, every time they see you, they know you're going to do something silly. So they just start laughing when they see you. <laughs> mm -hmm. But that's not the child's native disposition. The native disposition in a human child is seriousness. But by the time they get to school, we want them to think it's all fun and games. In that University of Islam that William spoke about earlier, and I'm sorry I didn't have the recorder on for that, but in that setup that Elijah Muhammad established, those children were not sitting there learning fairy tales and nursery rhymes. They were in those young grades. They were learning trigonometry and calculus that he spoke about. Right. They were learning that in elementary school. So that by the time they graduated from elementary school into high school, high schools, public high schools couldn't handle the, the, the children that came out of the old nation of Islam, University of Islam school. They couldn't handle it. And the Clara Muhammad school that Imam Muhammad, Imam W.D. Muhammad established after his father died. That Clara Muhammad school, even to, to this day, are graduating students who, who colleges are so happy to have them because they are so advanced because they never spent time in fairy tale land. You see? So we're busy thinking that children cannot accommodate heavy information or, you know, complex information, but their brains are retrofitted for complicated information. If we understood how the brain actually learns at those ages, we'll know that that's the best time to give them complicated information. You understand? So we're talking about concepts. The brain is designed to operate based on frequencies. And just to put a plug in for Ramadan, Ramadan is the best time of year in order to help the human brain become resituated with its original frequency patterns. Now, how does how does Instructor Bilal know that? Because of what Allah said Ramadan is for. He never says that Ramadan is for fasting, as though fasting is the purpose. Mm -hmm. fasting is not the purpose of Ramadan mm -hmm. Allah says that the month of Ramadan is the month in which the Quran was sent down as guidance who that? Linas, for all people not just for Muslims not just for people running to make uh, Tarawi the baseline intuitive man there you go. You got it. He got that meaning for Nas. Yeah. And that's the majority of people. The majority of people will never be scholars. They'll never be highly educated. They'll never be college graduates. The majority of people will always be people who are just sniffing their way through life, hoping to 
stay out of trouble. Mm. You know, your mother used to say, why you stick your nose in that trouble? Mm. <laughs> Get your nose out of my business. <laughs> Because nas is nose, nas is nose, and nose, as you are saying, is symbolic of the intuition. Mm -hmm. I smell something. No, you don't. That's your intuition working, right? So we use the nose as a symbol of what we intuit. And that's what's operating in most people. So when you educate a child, that's the focus. Mm -hmm. You have to know something about human intuition and how it works, how it develops, and how it is designed by Allah to graduate you into rational and moral success mm -hmm. as far as your ideas go. You don't start by just telling them what's good and what's bad. No, you start by telling them what's inside of them, mm. germinating inside of them, and then you assist that growth. You don't force it. You don't force the plant up out of the soil up out of the, to grow. You don't pull it. By its leaves, right? You give it what it needs in the environment so that the environment will become the support for that new life. Same thing with our children. Okay. Now, and I know I can be all over the place, but you'll get the replay and you'll put it all back together like a puzzle. I just give you puzzle pieces. And then when you see it again, you go, oh, that's what he meant, you know. Now, <laughs> guidance for mankind. And Allah also says that it is not only hudan, but furqan. And they translate that as the criteria. Sometimes they call it the discrimination. Furqan. Now, what is this discrimination? If you turn your radio on or your television and you begin to flick through the channels or spin the dial on the radio, you're coming in and out of frequencies. All of the frequencies on your radio band are already present. Pretty sure. Yes. But you have to be in tune with the frequency you're looking for in order for you to perceive it. Mm -hmm. That's why I keep saying, as Imam Muhammad said, that if the, the fitra is here to, to help everybody, but you have to be conscious of it in order for it to help you. If you have no idea what the fitra is or how the fitra operates, and how to utilize it, it's like, you know, having money in the bank that you don't know about, an inheritance that nobody ever told you about. It's not that it's not yours and that you can't just go and use it whenever you want to, but if nobody even told you you inherited it, yeah. and that it's in this bank account under this number, you die, the money will be there and somebody else will get it. So that's how the fitra is also. Somebody has to let you know what the fitra is, how you can access it. They have to let you know who Allah is, how you can access Allah. Allah tells you these things in the Quran. Call on me. I will respond to you, right? Uh, when they ask you about me, uh, I am near. I answer the prayer of every caller when he calls. See, that's Allah. He didn't say you have to do no ritual. He didn't say first you have to make wudu. <laughs> you understand what I'm saying? Yes, yes. And then say, you know, a thousand dhikrs. Mm -hmm. And then and then call, then ask him, and maybe he'll respond if you if your dickers were pure, you know, if it was from the core of the heart, <laughs> then I'll let him. He doesn't say that. He leaves room even for the insincere person to call on him, and Allah still says, I will respond. And immediately, Ujibu, I will respond immediately when my ibad, when they call on me. So these are the sciences that the Quran is providing us with because that's where the assistance is for where we need to go as Muslims. We've been taken away from that core. That is our core, the hudan and the furqan. Furqan is consonantally connected to the word frequency through the F, the R, and the Q. And frequency is from frequent, which means to do something over and over again. If I go to the local pub over and over again, they say I frequented the bar. Hmm. <laughs> okay? And every time I frequent the bar, I connect with the bar, that connectivity we're talking about. I'm connected. I know the bar. I know the owner. I know everybody who's a regular in there. I know what they serve. I know what not to ask for because I know this bar is not going to have it. Hmm. Okay? It's like going shopping. I don't go to a particular supermarket because I know they're never going to have that other thing I keep looking for and asking about. They don't have it. I have to go to a different store for that. So wherever you go, where you go frequently, you become familiar. Mm -hmm. 
That's the purpose of the Quran. That's the purpose of Ramadan, to re-familiarize you with the Quran, with the Hudan, with the guidance, not to re-familiarize you with fasting. Fasting is your own individual endeavor. And I'm going to tell you something else that people will run after me and try to chop my head off about. But fasting in the Quran is not mandatory. Yeah. It's voluntary. Yeah. It is suggested. But there's no language that Allah uses in the Quran to suggest that it is an amr. Yeah. That it's a command from Allah, like many of the other things in the Quran. So the reason we need to refamiliarize ourselves with the Quran is for this very reason that we have been taken off the core away from the core of the central messages of the Quran through the introduction of sidebar conversations through hadiths those are sidebars and many of those sidebars are like the bar I just spoke about where you go to take a drink and get high and get drunk and forget your frustrations and people have been drinking and sipping and wallowing in the liquid pouring down of hadiths to the point where they can't recognize the Quran anymore because their allegiance is now mm -hmm. to, the, to the Hadith tellers. Yeah. Okay. So Nunetics is not here to establish tales and narratives from history, whether they be true or false. I don't need the narrative. When I have the direct message from the from the the Rabb al Alim of the Alameen, <laughs> I got the direct message. You understand? I don't need you to tell me what Daddy said. When Daddy told me what Daddy said, I don't need you as my sibling to come and say, "Well, Daddy, no, I was there when he said it." <laughs> you don't have to repeat it to me. I was there with you. Well, there's something you might have missed. I didn't miss it. If I miss it, I just go back and ask Daddy what he said. You know. So if we miss something, we go back and ask the Quran. We ask Allah what he said and by going and revisiting the Quran. So the Quran is represented by frequencies. But they are frequencies that you have to know how to channel into, to tune into, in order for you to pick up that band wave. Hmm. So while I'm listening to jazz up the dial, you can be listening to country or rock and roll in another part of that band doesn't make your country or your rock and roll not legitimate. It's just what you like. Mm. And people will read the Quran and they'll come out as a master mathematician like this man here, William. Mm -hmm. But I can't stand math. I'm not going to put it that way. I was never good at math. <laughs> I almost didn't graduate from high school because of my poor math skills. To this day, when people ask me to add something up, I, I cringe. But I love language and I love words. That's my special. That's where I am on the band. William is over here. You're over there. Your wife is over here. Everybody's somewhere different on the band, but we're all on the same radio. You see? That's what the Quran is. You have to know how to tune into your particular channel. Hmm. So the focus for the Quran and the focus for Ramadan is to retune yourself after having been untuned like an instrument gets untuned from time to time. You got to go back to the guitar neck and the guitar and then you have to look at the keys, go to the keys mm -hmm. and start retuning the instrument, the bass or the guitar or whatever, or the piano, you know, you can go up under there and you start retuning, right? That's what Ramadan is for. And people use various means and methods to accomplish that retuning. As I said in last week's class, contemplation, meditation, concentration, mm. whatever your prayer discipline is or your communication with the Most High is, let it involve those three things. And Allah leaves it open. He leaves it open-ended for you to find your bandwidth. You said concentration, com uh... Concentration, contemplation, meditation, and the, just those three. Just those three, okay. Yeah. yeah. And the 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 concentration, as you can see, the word center is in concentration. Because concentration is designed to bring your mind back to its central focus, to a central focus. Mm. So you have to have something to concentrate on. on yeah. That's where Allah leaves the individual to decide mm -hmm. what is your preference. What do you what do you want from me? You know, <laughs> kind of thing. Well, Allah, I'm calling on you about next week's uh, rent. You know, <laughs> whatever yeah, it could be, whatever you need. Allah yeah. says, I didn't. He didn't put a limit on it. See, 
we want Nunetics Institute, then it has to become our central focus. It has to be the, to come the thing that we that we center our energies on, our mental energies, right? Then you have meditation. That's also from med, which is give, gives us the word middle. So it's talking about the same thing. You have to find that midway point, which means that when you establish something or when you ask for something, make sure that you're asking for something through the framework of balance. Don't be extreme. Don't go to Allah asking Allah to blow up the whole state of Israel. <laughs> yeah. Just make it disappear, Allah. Make it not knowing that there are Palestinians there too. Mm -hmm. <laughs> okay, let's say it disappears tomorrow. All those, uh, you know, thousands and thousands of lives, right? So you got to be careful what you ask for because you just might get it, mm -hmm. right? So you have to first evaluate what it is you're seeking from Allah from the viewpoint of what is the most balanced dua that I can make. Okay. And, and the Quran gives you the parameters for that because you have prophets in the Quran who are asking for forgiveness from Allah for mistakes that they have made or might have made. Mm. <clears throat> prophets. So who are we not to ask Allah for forgiveness? Mm. And that brings the mind back to its balance. The balance is that I am not Allah. Yeah, I have power and authority in the land and all of that, but I'm not the one who created all of this. I'm not the source creator. I'm just a, a small force in creation, a force creator, if you will. And then contemplation gives you your template. See, if you're building a computer or you're doing anything, and even in mathematics, I believe, William, they use, yeah. they use templates, sure. right? Because you need a model. So the mind has to have a model. Do you have a model of the community that you want to establish? Mm. Do you have a template? Do you have a model for the Nunetics Institute, Instructor Bilal? Is there, can you tell me what that looks like at the end? Because mm -hmm. if you can't tell me what it looks like, it'll never come into being. Mm -hmm. You have to already see it. That's what we spoke about yesterday, right? You have to already see it. And even though you're asking for something to come in the future, you have to ask for it as though it already exists in the present. This morning. Yes. This very binder of mine. I opened it up and I have a page of questions. It's called my daily action plan. Imagine that from today for the next two or three years, everything goes perfectly in your life, your business and your career, your health, your relationships. Everything goes perfectly. All you could ever want in these areas have come true. What is the life you're living in three years? And every morning, I pick up this, and I write down everything. I answer those questions. And that's I relate to that. I'm living that. And I just like to emphasize that every single person should be doing that. That's right. That's right. So you've, are, you've already set the template. You came with a template that mm -hmm. uh, is worthy of the listeners. To this recording, whoever they may be, it's worthy of you following if you're not yet doing that. My wife and I do that, and sometimes we end up just writing stuff on the wall. Mm. Things that we want to remember to say every day or to do every day. We put it in notebooks. We between the two of us, we have to have at least 200 notebooks in this house. <laughs> yeah. I'm not, you know, I'll be 64 in a couple of months in July. You know, I, I don't remember everything like I used to, you know. So the best thing is to is to commit it to writing, as the Quran tells us about other things related to business, right? Well, it's the same thing. Commit it to writing so you can revisit it. You can revamp it. Mm. You can add to it or take away from it, but at least it's in writing, mm -hmm. right? So that's another part of the edu uh, education process that we have to emphasize to our children. They're, they're falling out of love with writing. I, I watched English writing go from beautiful script to graffiti mm -hmm. in school. They don't even encourage. I think they're discouraging writing now in school in yeah. favor of all these gadgets. Yeah. See? So, like I said, there's, a, there's an undercurrent now uh, amongst people who are in positions of serious power to... Uh, acclimate us towards the artificial intelligence world. Mm. So whatever is a part of your human ingenuity, such as writing, because writing, as you know, is the case, is the case, the perfect study for personality. 
how to determine people's personalities, whether they make, you know, big loops, <laughs> you know, whether they do straight lines, whether they write in a straight line or whether they're writing goes up. Like my writing always, if I'm writing on a blackboard, as much as I try to write straight, it always goes up like this. Uh, yeah, when I step back and look at it, I say, oh, there it is. <laughs> yeah, right? But I'm understanding now what Allah was telling me. Uh, See, it was a message for me from Allah. It's not that people couldn't read it. It's just that it always came like it was heading towards Sarat al Mustafim. I kept writing. <laughs> but uh, so that's that part of that. But the point is, is that the Quran holds the science for how to properly educate the mind and the emotions and the instincts. All three of those have to be in your curriculum. How to educate the intellect, how to educate the emotionality, and how to educate the instinctive nature. All three of those have to be in your plan, beginning with the instinctive nature. And if you don't know anything about human instincts, you shouldn't be in a classroom teaching children. You can you can do it if it's if it's junior high school, college, you know that that they're past that. But those new ones coming in there at five years old, six, seven years old, you have to know something about human instinct, and not according to Sigmund the fraud, mm. not according to BF this one who's trying to skin all of us, BF Skinner. He's trying to skin a cat with his psychology. You are what you do. Man, do you know what kind of world this would be if we really believe that? <laughs> you see? You look at people in the ghetto who have been deprived of certain things, and material things and money and opportunities and all of that. And then they, they, their families are starving maybe or whatever. And they go out and they steal some food or whatever. And you say, well, he deserves to be locked up for this amount of time because he stole some food. Mm. But you, you're you judging him by what he did. You don't know the motivation behind what he did. Mm -hmm. See? So if I am my behavior, see? That's what the behaviorists are saying. You are your behavior, what you do. No, you're not what you do. Something is motivating what you did. Mm -hmm. Something got corrupted mm -hmm. that led you to do what it is you did. And until we determine what that core uh action or, or or thought in this case is or was we're not going to be able to solve that problem it's an equation it's a math you have to be able to put this together with that and then it's supposed to equal something at the end so i'm going to go over just a couple of other terms and and then i'll let you guys speak if you have anything else to say and then we'll be finished with today but the purpose for today actually was really to introduce you to each other and to ask very gently that we continue to meet in the interest of forming a true core curriculum. See, even the word core is in the word curriculum. It's a core curriculum, not really a curriculum, although it doesn't matter the vowel. It's mm -hmm. still the same, right? Because the word curriculum does anyone know where that word comes from? What other word? English word? Syllabus. <clears throat> no. No, not a syllabus. Although that's a very important word. We'll get back to that. It'll surprise you to know if you don't already know. Mm -hmm. Okay. The word curriculum comes from the word parent. Like a, a current in a in a sea or in a river. Yeah. And also like a current as in right now. Mm. So your education should have a focus on what's happening now. Mm. I think they have a book to that effect, right? Now, the book of what now. You have to have your mind, you, you, all right, the history and what happened before is okay, but you have to know what's going on currently. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. See, and the current carries you into different parts of the seaside or the land or whatever. And you're looking at towns as you go by and the river and the boat and the one in the ship or whatever. You're passing scenes all of the time. And that was nice what I saw 30 minutes ago. But look at this here right now. Mm. 
<laughs> you you don't just stay on the boat in your room and talk about what what you saw 30 minutes ago or where you were in Puerto Rico 30 minutes ago. Now you're in the Dominican Republic. <laughs> mm -hmm. You've got to concentrate on where you are now. See, mm -hmm. that's what curriculum is supposed to be doing. And that's what it is not doing, generally speaking, for the public mind. But this is what the Nunetics is going to focus on. What is happening now? Because if you can assess properly what's happening now, you can better assess and possibly even regulate what's going to happen in the future. Does that make sense? It's mm -hmm. called preparation. Mm -hmm. But you have to know what's going on now in order to prepare for what might happen in the future. So that's where we are. And that's why Allah in the Quran gives us these statements that although they are futuristic, that uh, certainly the faithful ones will win through. That's a prediction for the future. But the language that Allah uses when he uses the word Qad, Q-A-D, that's a very strong word in the Quran. Mm -hmm. Only to be uh, uh, matched or um, compared to Laqad. So there's mm -hmm. Qad, when Allah says certainly, and then there's Laqad, which means most definitely. Mm -hmm. See? So what is Qad? When Allah says Qad Eflihan al Mu'minun, that the Mu'minun, the believers, shall win through or will win through. But some of the uh, translators make a point to say that that activity, that word, God suggests that it, it, it already has happened. It's already slated. Hmm. It's like being on the assembly line in the Ford Motor Company as a manufacturer. And although the first thing you might start putting together is the chassis or the motor or whatever. You got all of these parts, but in your mind, you already see a fully formed car mm -hmm. because you had a schematic. Mm -hmm. you, you had a template <laughs> like we talked about. You, you had a picture of it. Like I said, we put pictures of things we want on the wall. If I want a new car, I find the exact car that I want and I put it on my wall so I'll see it every day. I'll put it on the refrigerator. Mm -hmm. There are people who have put the the type of mate they would like to marry on their wall mm. and, and looked at it every day and saw themselves going different places to the movies to the supermarket with it and that person just shows up yep. it sounds spooky i know you know what i'm talking about yep. it sounds spooky but it's not it's more real than what we think is real in terms of what allah does how he brings things out of nowhere into somewhere kun fayakun that's the process he uses he says to it, be, and it, it comes into existence. So we have to follow the Quranic prescription. Mm. And not all of these other wizards who stepped into the picture thinking that they knew better than Allah, mm. how to teach you and what to tell you. So the curriculum is based on the current. And the current, as you know, is either water, there's one other current. What is, well, there are two other currents. What are they? electricity for one yeah air and electricity that's right so you got all the currents now you got the water current mm -hmm. that they also call waves right then you have the air currents that they also call waves mm -hmm. invisible though mm -hmm. so the first set of currents are visible mm -hmm. although in many cases it can be clear you can see through it you see the fish, you know, beneath the sea, you know, that kind of thing. But the air currents, you can't see them at all. You can only feel them. This is the true basis for human psychology. It's in the fitra. It's not in Freud, the fraud. It's in the fitra of Allah. True human-based psychology. Because as we said earlier, the human brain operates based on frequencies also and waves hmm. theta waves beta waves gamma waves you know all, you know, all of the waves right but they are invisible also and they are a part of the electric current 
those brain waves, that's electricity. Hmm. Lightning strikes right up here. Clouds develop right here. And sometimes those clouds, that confusion, they get so heavy, man, that it causes rain to happen. You get so confused that you start raining down tears hmm. because of the, I don't know what to do about that rent next month. I don't want to be put out again. You know, you start, the confusion is doing that. So that's where we have to go for what I call fitra-based psychology. So that's that's curriculum. Mm -hmm. So compare those three things, the water, the air, and the, you might as well reduce uh, electricity down to fire, those elements, right? And that's that's where your psychology, that's where it's going to grow out of. It's going to come out of that. Just keep studying the, the behaviors of those three elements. And that's where your curriculum is going to come from. Now, you have the word education itself. It comes from a smaller word called educe. E-D-U-C-E. -E. And the word educe comes from a Latin verb, which means to lead out or to bring out, to educe. The letter E on the beginning of a word normally means to, to go out, like exit. It means to go out from somewhere, right? Egypt, they left Egypt, right? So educe means to bring out or lead out whatever deuce is. Now it's going to get a little bit complicated, but you can handle this. You ready for it? Mm -hmm. If I spell deuce as D-E-U-C-E, -E, what does that mean? What is Two. it? Yeah, go ahead, mathematics. Boy, if you didn't answer, I was going to, I was going to talk about you. <laughs> <laughs> That's math right there. Yeah, we speak about deuce as two. You've heard of that, right? I mean, yeah, if, if you haven't, okay, that's okay. Because we don't use it anymore. That's probably why you haven't heard it in your age category. But William and I, we, we know deuce, right? Um, and in fact, there are some uh, young people, I think it developed during the hip hop, whole episode of hip hop language, that they, they have something called chucking a deuce. Hmm. And you see them going around like this, the gangs and all of that, right? Uh, yeah, you know, yeah, that's, yeah, that chucking a deuce <laughs> too, right? But they don't know what it means. It's all code language that was fed to them by the language conspirators. They don't know. Even the word rap and hip hop, those are conspirator words that were invented to control the frequencies of our young people. I'll talk about that in a minute if I have time. Hip hop and rap. Remind me to talk about those two things if you have, if you have a few minutes left over. So... <clears throat> Educe means to bring out two things. To bring out two things. See, that's why they call a human being an individual. What are the last four letters in that word? Two. And what does that mean? Two. Deuce. That's right. But it is an individual, an indivisible dual. A duel that is supposed to stay together, not become separated. Mm. So what then is an individual? An individual is one who has been able to maintain that integrity of those two things that Allah put in you that are not supposed to be divided. Now I'm going to tell you what they are. Mm. This intellect and this heart they're supposed to operate as married as a married couple so if your emotions tell you to do something or to go a certain way but your intellect says there might be danger if you do that even though you you love it or you think it's going to be nice or, you know whatever you better be careful uh, hanging out with that guy. He's a gangbanger. You know, I know, you know, you, you think he's a nice guy because he gave you some money. You know, he lent you some money, you know, but so your heart is saying, I'm going to go see him again because I need some more money. But your intellect is saying, well, that might be a problem. <laughs> now, when you don't allow those two things 
to confer with each other like a husband and wife should, that's when problems begin in your household. This life. Because you are an individual, an indivisible dual. This heart right now, as it has blood purified for it through the liver, through the four chambers, four chambers of the heart, it sends preferential treatment up to the brain first before that blood circles back and services the rest of the body all the way down to your pinky toes. So that's telling you that Allah has prioritized your brain by allowing the heart that has recently purified that blood to give preferential treatment. And most of it, I think 85% of that blood flow is given to the brain first. See? That's a sign from Allah in the fitrah mm. that our concentration has to first be on the purification of the heart. Ain't no use in sending corrupt blood up to the brain. <laughs> you kill the person. The, once that blood becomes uh, purified through those chambers, <clears throat> of which there are four, <laughs> we're going to get to that four in a minute, then it sends that blood up, refreshing the brain. And then it says, okay, now I want you to distribute the rest of this nutrition to all of the rest of the body members. Spleen, everybody else gets some blood after that, all the way down to the pinky toe. And it, it does it against gravity, because once it gets to the bottom, it has to come back up to the heart. So that's a, that's a miracle in nature. How does blood act against gravity? How does, how does it do that? See? Now... We're still talking about education, the two things now that need to be introduced into the curriculum. First is information to help develop the emotionality, especially in the young children, very young children. And then we're to concentrate on forming the personality, the intellect, that part of the, of the uh, mind that begins to see things as different things. See, when you're very young, toddler, and that you're seeing everything really as one thing because you're born into Tawheed. So you don't see races. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? You don't see races, right? And because you can't really speak that well when you're born or when you're one years old or whatever, you don't even, you're not judging people based on language. You don't know that's a German accent. Mm. Or, you know, from he's from Nicaragua because of the accent or this guy's from Kenya. You know, have no idea. And it doesn't matter to you. That one, he can be black as my shoe. The other one can be white as this piece of paper. And to children, it matters not. Mm -hmm. Because they're in a Tawheed world of experience. And Allah put us in that Tawheed world of experience because he wanted us to maintain the integrity of Tawheed. Not to go off and start making improper judgments about differences, but to look at differences so that you can appreciate what Allah has done in all of this differentiation. And the differentiation is still one. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Oh, man, this thing is so beautiful. So mm -hmm. this is our curriculum. So you have to keep the emotionality situated so that you can build an intellect upon it. So when you start building the intellect and the intellect starts slicing and dicing, which the intellect is designed to do, so start piecing stuff apart and analyzing. I spoke about that word, anal eyes, analyze, or seeing things through a small peephole. See, there's a point where your intellect is not really looking at the holistic view. It starts looking at speciation, you know, what I, I, particularly about that. Like you're looking through the peephole in your, from your door inside your apartment. Mm -hmm. You don't see the whole person. But you might see enough of them to know that's Uncle Joe. I can let him in. Or this is the vacuum sailor, uh, salesman guy. I'm not answering the door. <laughs> All you need is to see him. Maybe, you know, see that he don't know you. You don't know. He's looking around, see who else is on. You know, you know that's not the person you want in your home or want to talk to at the time. So that's what the intellect is doing. The intellect, as I heard, uh, Sadhguru. <laughs> You've heard of Sadhguru? Yep. I heard him say something that has always stuck with me. He said that the intellect is like a knife. 
-hmm. He said, and in the hands of a maniac, man, oh man, that knife can do some damage, but in the hand of a trained professional, like a surgeon mm. or like a butcher who knows, yeah, I see. He, now he's a help. Mm. So you don't call the surgeon a butcher because he cut open your mother's chest to fix her heart. Mm -hmm. You call him a savior. Thank you. And when he cuts stuff up or cuts stuff out, he doesn't cut stuff out to leave her open, <laughs> to become infected, you know. He cuts her out so that he can take out the thing that's damaged or fix the thing that's damaged. And then he puts her back together again. That's the purpose of the intellect, but that's what's missing. They have trained our intellects to just pull the world apart. Black lives matter, but there's nothing there to put black back with white or back with brown or back with red or back with yellow. They don't have an ideology for that. Mm -hmm. See, only one thing matters for them. For the Ku Klux Klan, only white matters, white citizens council. For the Nation of Islam, only black people mattered at that time. Wasn't until Imam W.D. Muhammad came in that all people mattered for us. But prior to 1975, you were part of the white man's devil civilization if you were not us. Mm. And that's how they were allowed to get away with corruption because they thought righteousness was attached to this skin pigment. Mm. Okay, melanin. See, they thought this was the superiority. <laughs> so as long as you had this, they would just put up with whatever you did because he's just doing it in the name of being God. You know, black man is God. It was a crazy, crazy ideology. Mm -hmm. And it was 1975, W.D. Muhammad. That's why I, I, I refer to him so often because he created a miracle on this earth by the grace of Allah mm -hmm. when he introduced his perspective on the Quran. Nation of Islam didn't know anything about the Quran. They, they, all they knew was that they had it as a book on their top shelf in their house. They said, put the Quran up higher than any other book. But they said, don't read it. They told the Nation of Islam, don't read the Quran. You're not ready for that. Read the Bible. I'm explaining the Bible right now. And a lot of the core ruptures came during that period. And they're still here, but they can only thrive, even as in your case, in the Islamic school, those core corruptors can only thrive when your core has been disrupted mm -hmm. and your core should be not the tales and the other stuff that's being told, your core has to be the core on. Mm -hmm. You get it? Mm -hmm. Yeah, your core has to be the core and. It's beautiful when you understand. It's beautifully put. Uh, yeah. Sure. I don't want to interrupt, but I do have to leave in uh, yeah, okay. five minutes. And not um, if, you, if you want to continue, go ahead. She's going to go here. I have lunch in Boston, so I have to travel up. Oh, yeah, for sure, for sure. We're going to let you go. I had only intended to be here till uh, 1030. Oh, so okay. we're, yeah. we're doing okay. We're doing okay. And again, like I said yesterday, this is not going to be our last time. This is just basically an introduction. Absolutely. So the whole point in the whole idea of education is education is meant to educe or bring out those two um parts of the human personality related sure. to your emotions and related to your intellect. You have to be able to weave them together so that be, they, 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 are, they become a, a consistent matrix so that when you start to lay your life out, it fits perfectly upon that matrix. Mm -hmm. All right. So the curriculum again has to contain elements that support both natural fitra based emotions. And we'll talk about what that is in the future and natural fitra based intellect, which is designed not like the robber who takes the knife and cuts you to pieces, but like the surgeon, mm -hmm. the trained professional is able to open things up for you and say, now here is the conclusion. They can open up the, the subject of slavery, but they say the conclusion is that slavery ha was dealt with through these legislations and that people on their own without government interference have been able to institute these behaviors and these businesses. And, and now I'm living down here in Raleigh, North Carolina, where slavery was rampant. Mm -hmm. And I'm finding that some of my best relationships down here are with so-called white people. Mm. And that's sometimes without them even knowing me, who I am, what I do, just seeing me. Hey, how are you? How are you, sir? Can you imagine an 85-year-old white man calling me sir when I know what he experienced when he was my age or, or, or younger, when he was a teenager? I know what he was looking at here in the South. Probably my uncle, my cousin, hanging up on a tree somewhere or being shot for no reason, for, for stepping on the sidewalk while his wife was walking. See? Uh -huh. and, and I was too close. 
he he'll shoot you for that. But you were supposed to walk in the street when white people came by. So that those are those are those are those are real sensitive areas of our history that some people can't they can't get that out of their minds, but they treat that past, like we said about the curriculum and the current, they treat it like it's current. Mm. So we have to refashion the entire scenario for people now to do, and we can do it through pneumatics. All right. So I'm I'm through. I think this was a great session. I believe mm -hmm. so, yes. Thank Indeed. you very much. And inshallah, uh, maybe hopefully, uh, you know, maybe once a week we can do this and uh, we can also email each other and text each other our concerns and our discoveries. And uh, we'll talk more concretely next week about the actual idea that your wife brought to me yesterday concerning um, how she would like to see this alternative type of schooling or education come into being. I don't like the word alternative alternative because it means alter the nature you know oh, yeah okay. yeah i don't like that that's a satan word right there so we got to find another way to express the natural way yeah okay. yeah right yeah okay so with that said travel safely both of you and all three of you william if you're about to make some moves i'm about to make some moves starting with <laughs> breakfast <laughs> <laughs> and inshallah um if 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 no one else objects, I'm going to post this to YouTube so that other people can get the benefit from it. Again, I apologize, William, for not having my recorder on, but we're going to still, you know, we do what we do. Right, no problem. Um, yeah. We're going to revisit all of our histories in a way that uh, the audience can truly appreciate. So thank you all for being with me. Thank you, dear instructor. All right. Thank so you. Salam alaikum. Alaikum. It was a pleasure meeting you both. Alaikum salam, everyone. Yes, really? always a pleasure. Thank you for being present. You're Assalamu alaikum. Wa alaikum assalam.